The goal of the 19th is really to change the conversation around how we talk about women in politics. We are firm believers that all issues are women's issues. Our readers are people who want to be better informed and better able to participate in democracy. We're aiming to change the future of American journalism by giving women the platform and the voice that they deserve. There's never been a better moment than right now. The 19th is the newsroom that we've been waiting for. Hi everyone and welcome to day two of the 19th Represents, a week of virtual events aimed at celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment and examining how far women still have left to go. My name is Emily Ramshaw and I'm the co-founder and CEO of the 19th, a nonprofit newsroom that launched last week at the intersection of gender, politics, and policy. Today we're going to go deep on suffrage, from the unequal history behind the 19th Amendment to the modern day fight to extend voting rights protections to far more Americans. And we're going to start with a conversation with the woman who is in many ways leading the charge for greater equity in our democracy, voting rights activist and former Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams. We'll follow Leader Abrams with some fantastic readings of historical suffrage speeches by actors Meryl Streep and Zoe Saldana, and a panel discussion on the unequal history of suffrage for women of color with the New York Times Magazine's Nicole Hannah-Jones, the Black Futures Lab's Alicia Garza, Photo Latino's Maria Teresa Kumar, and author and professor Martha S. Jones. Before we begin today's programming, I want to thank the sponsors and philanthropic partners who made this week possible. Goldman Sachs, Intuit, The Impact Seat, The Lenfest Institute, The Philadelphia Inquirer, The Wincote Foundation, The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, The Barbara Lee Family Foundation, The Stardust Fund, Pan America, The Heinz Endowments, CVS Health, the Panacea Collective, Aero PR, and Lingua Franca. I also want to let you know that the 19th is a member-supported newsroom, and we can't put on great free programming like this without your support. We hope you'll join us at 19thnews.org. Every $19 helps. If you missed yesterday's program or want to rewatch it, visit 19thnews.org forward slash events. With that, I'm thrilled to introduce the 19th editor at large, Aaron Haynes, to kick off today's programming with leader Stacey Abrams. Stacey, thank you so much for joining us on day two of the 19th Represents. It is great to have you here as we mark the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Thank you for having me. Well, listen, I want to start there because, you know, it is uh, the centennial of the, the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which as I'm sure you know, uh, granted uh, access uh, to the franchise for white women. Uh, black women had to fight twice as hard for access uh, to the ballot uh, and did not get that really fully until the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, the anniversary of which we just marked uh, last week. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, I mean, we're celebrating this centennial at a time when voting rights and voter access is really in peril. Uh, I, I guess just your, your thoughts uh, overall on, on where we are uh, and th at the centennial of the 19th Amendment. I think we have to begin by understanding who the right to vote was intended for. And that means going to the founding documents. The Declaration of Independence was a wonderful premise, but the Constitution did not pretend to actually take it into consideration. As you pointed out, African Americans, Blacks were considered subhuman. Uh, Native Americans were actually excluded in their entirety, and women were silent. It took the 15th Amendment for Black men to get the right to vote, the 19th Amendment for white women. Native Americans didn't get citizenship until 1924, so after women, white women had the right to vote, finally Native Americans had the right to citizenship. And to your point, in 1965, the Voting Rights Act said, finally, that women of color were included in this universe of voters. But even that didn't become wholly real for some communities until 1975 with the second reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, which brought in language, which allowed Latinos and those of Asian descent who spoke a different language, Native Americans who still were being faced with literacy tests. It finally included everyone. And unfortunately, that halcyon period of what I would say was closer to 45 years than 55 years abruptly ended with the evisceration of the Voting Rights Act in 2013 by the Supreme Court. But what we have to understand is that that was actually Act Two of the 21st century version of voter suppression. 
Act One began when, when Indiana and Georgia both passed voter ID laws that were more restrictive than any access laws had been before. And so what we have watched, unfortunately, unfold for nearly the last 20 years is the steady erosion of access to the right to vote. Because voter suppression is not the guns and hoses, not the exclusion wholesale of an entire gender, which is what the 19th Amendment fixed or attempted to start fixing. It's the prevention or discouragement of people from exercising the franchise in total. And that unfortunately has accelerated in the last decade. And what we're watching in 2020 is the pinnacle of this attempt to suppress the right to vote through misinformation, through exclusion, through malfeasance, and sometimes through incompetence. And so I do think the right to vote is in peril, but we're also celebrating in this year the fights we've had to protect it. And my belief is that if we renew that vigor and that determination, we can make 2020 a year when the right to vote in America is preserved. Well, a little bit of optimism there at the end, and, and, and that's interesting because I certainly uh, know that, that you are very much in the fight uh, to, to protect voting rights. That was something that you were already looking at headed into 2020, even before we uh, found ourselves in the midst of a pandemic, and the pandemic has pre uh, presented even new challenges uh, to access to the franchise. I guess with, with that in mind, I mean, we're now less than 90 days out uh, from Election Day. Uh, I mean, have we run out of time to really stand up the kind of infrastructure that we're going to need as a country for the majority of Americans to vote safely and participate in this democracy? We have not run out of time. And, and I want to say this is an optimism. It's a real clear eyed vision of history. I know what we have faced before and I know what we were able to do. In the midst of the Civil War, we had elections. In the midst of the Spanish flu, we had elections. And so calamity, catastrophe, and incompetence should not be sufficient to block the execution of elections. But what we need is the security of those elections and faith in those elections. And I think that's what's at risk. And so, yes, we have time. If Congress will take action and will actually invest in the HEROES Act in that $3.6 billion that will scale up our voting infrastructure across the country for Democrats, Republicans, independents, then we will have the capacity to not only have voting that works, we'll have voting that works well. And that's part of the challenge because what we're watching is an unprecedented use of vote by mail, absentee ballots, mail and voting, all the exact same thing. But we have uneven application of the laws, uneven access to the opportunity. And unfortunately we have misinformation and lies being spewed by the president of the United States. And so what we have to do is to recognize that the, the magic pill, as it were, would be that $3.6 billion, which would allow scaling up the infrastructure, hiring the people we need, ensuring that we've got the guardrails necessary to make certain it works. But short of that, we are not exonerated and exempted from the obligation to have fair elections. And so what we've been doing through Fair Fight and what I know has been happening through other organizations is we're trying to do the part that we have to do, assuming that the Congress doesn't do what it should do. And let's be clear that the Republican Senate leadership has failed to do. If we do things right, we've got time to do it so that it is seamless and or at least easier for Americans. But short of that, we're going to have to ask Americans to risk their lives, to take extraordinary measures. But that doesn't mean we can't do something, because the bottom line is, if Americans do not take democracy into our own hands, then we will lose, I think, even more of our democracy heading into the next administration. Yeah, I mean, to your point, uh, we saw that, that um, you know, the, the legislation to, um, you know, uh, around the Voting Rights Act was just renamed for, for the late Congressman John Lewis, uh, a phrase that I still can't even believe that I'm using uh, right now. Um, I mean, how optimistic, given that, you know, we saw, uh, we saw Republican lawmakers expressing their condolence for, for their, um, you know, for their former colleague, uh, that, that there can be bipartisan legislation passed around access uh, to the ballot. So let, let's bifurcate what needs to happen in 2020 from what needs to happen in 2021. There is no universe in which Republicans are as in mass are going to do the right thing and restore access to the right to vote for all Americans who are le legally eligible to vote. They are not going to do what should be done and restore the Voting Rights Act to full force 
because they understand that in the states that have taken advantage of its evisceration, that's where voter suppression has had the greatest effect on elections and on suppressing the right to vote. So that's not going to happen. But what must happen, and what we're actually watching in bipartisan fashion, is that Democrats and Republicans, secretaries of state, uh, the one that I have here in Georgia had a moment of, you know, awareness and awakeness, and it is, you know, now dissipated. But around the country, we have seen Democratic and Republican leaders say, this isn't about who we select. It's about the process of having elections themselves. We know that the elderly rely on vote by mail. And this deeply cynical behavior by DeJoy and by the Trump administration to slow down access to the mail, they may be targeting Democrats, but they're hurting everyone. We know that in states that have refused to take action to expand access to vote by mail, that they're actually undercutting the viability of electing their own, their own tribe. And what we have to remember is that the process of elections is not partisan. I am a Democrat, that's unequivocal, but I'm an American first. And my fight for the right to vote is designed to not only support folks who share my political ideology, but to make certain that my Republican friends or my Republican frenemies, that they also can pick the people they choose. Because in a representative democracy, you have to have the ability to pick your representatives. And if you cannot, then democracy is not real. And so I, I'm not optimistic that we will do the right thing in, in total, but I am optimistic that we will do enough to continue the, the experiment of democracy that has existed in the United States for 240 plus years. I want to ask you about, you know, what you're what you're hearing from voters uh, about their concerns about being able to vote safely and what advice you're giving uh, to, to those voters who, who frankly may have to, as you said, risk their lives to cast a ballot uh, in November. Particularly, I'm thinking about, you know, the black voters uh, or, or voters who have lived living in areas that have a historic record of disenfranchisement, right, who people, you know, like our parents, grandparents who want to you know, put that ballot in the box. They want to see that uh, process happen in real time because of, of you know, a, a proven record of disenfranchisement in the past in some of those communities, uh, getting them warmed up to the idea of mail-in absentee voting. Uh, is, 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 is that something that has been a challenge or are you seeing that those Black voters are also uh, enthusiastic about voting no matter how they have to do it? Well, let's start with Black voters. Look, it's not paranoia if they really are after you. And we have ample evidence that black voters face the longest lines, that we have two times the rejection rate of our absentee ballots, that there have been voter ID laws that specifically targeted the likelihood of our access to the right to vote, and that this has been an historical pattern since the inception of our country. So it is not paranoia to say that they are trying to steal our right to vote. But what we do know is also true is what John Lewis and C.T. Vivian and Joseph Lowry, three giants that we lost in 2020, what they fought for, the remnants remain. And what I was so proud of in Georgia in particular, I know your family's here as well, was that despite having the longest lines in the country, despite having a public meltdown, a collapse of infrastructure, we still saw a record number of black voters turn out by mail and in person to cast their ballots, more than 770,000 in a primary. And to put that into context, in 2018, 1.2 million African Americans voted for me. And so we know that the participation rate is not diminished in a state like Georgia. But we also know that Georgia has a different set of challenges than say a Wisconsin or Michigan or North Carolina or South Carolina. And so part of what I've been trying to do through Fair Fight is work in each of those states to make certain that no matter who you are, you have access. If you're Latino, you also face twice the rate of rejection of absentee ballots. You face language barriers that are real. If you're in the AAPI community, you have language barriers because often you haven't hit a critical mass in a lot of states to get the ballots in your language. And we know there are cross-fertilization of challenges for young voters of color, for young voters who are disabled, for disabled voters of color. And so here's, here's what I tell people. Number one, they are trying to steal vote by mail. Don't let them. In 42 states now, you can vote by mail with no excuses. At the start of this pandemic, it was 34. So we've made dramatic progress. But that progress was made through lobbying, through advocacy, through litigation, and through legislation. But now in 42 states, you can vote by mail. If you want to know your, your rules in your state, go to vote.org, and it can tell you which state you're in. It can tell you what your options are. 
but we can also vote early. One of the reasons for voting by mail is so that you can vote safely without having to break the social distancing rule, without having to put your life in jeopardy. If you vote early, if your state allows it, 41 states allow early voting. So find out if your state is one of the states that allows early voting, vote early so that you can avoid the rush of election day. But we also know on election day, people, there are millions of Americans who have no choice. We have nearly 40 million Americans subject to evictions. And regardless of the AirSat's you know, executive order that's going to stop them, I know of people who are already facing eviction. And so vote by mail is not going to work because they're not going to be in locations that are stable. They're going to have to vote in person and they're going to want to vote because that's the only way to get the recovery they need. And so I think the responsible action is to recognize vote by mail if you can, vote early as soon as you're eligible, vote early. If you live in a state that has drop boxes, use them. And if you live in a state that doesn't, demand them. We act as though sometimes as though this is being done to us and that is true, but we can also demand better. And if they don't deliver better, that tells us the kind of leadership we have. And so I encourage every American, if you live in a community that does not have drop boxes, call your elections officials and demand those drop boxes. Call the secretary of state. But if you can't vote by mail, vote early. And by God, no matter what, please vote on election day. You know, one thing I want to ask you about as well, because we're seeing, I mean, we're over the 5 million mark in terms of Americans who have contracted coronavirus. Uh, deaths are also continuing to rise. We're expecting possibly another surge of coronavirus headed into the fall. What if there are voters uh, who have contracted coronavirus who are then worried about how they would be able to cast a ballot if, if that um, diagnosis uh, coincides with election day, for example, how are they to cast a ballot safely? And I think that's, that's one of the senses of urgency driving me and the dozens of organizations fighting for access now. We know that if the HEROES Act passes with the Klobuchar Wyden prerogatives, the rules that they have set in that legislation, it will create guardrails that protect against what's happening now and what we can expect to happen next. That is making certain there are 15 days at least of in-person early voting, making certain that you can vote by mail with no excuse. Those two provisions will help communities, especially those who are most likely to face that second surge, because we, to your point, we have to remember, we're in the first wave of coronavirus, the second peak. We're waiting for the second wave to hit in the fall. And that means that as soon as you can vote, do so. In Georgia, for example, we have good rules. We just have terrible implementation and malfeasant application. And so in Georgia, you can apply for your absentee ballot 180 days before the election. If you live in Georgia, apply for your ballot now. You can apply for it at this moment, and it will arrive at least 40 days before the election. If you live in a state with absentee ballots, know your rules. Go to vote.org, go to fairfight2020.org, find out what you need to know, and that will help you anticipate it. We don't know what's going to happen. Unfortunately, we live in a nation where our scientists who provide the data and the insight are being silenced, but we can still get that information. But we need to presume the worst is going to happen, and so we've got to be prepared by acting as quickly as possible. That's voting early, voting by mail, and if you have to make a plan to vote that doesn't include those two things, think about what the consequences are if you have to vote on election day. Yeah, I mean, you've talked, we've talked so much uh, about the idea of a voter plan, uh, and, and, and that is something uh, that is, it, you found to be even necessary in, in the Georgia primary. I, I mean, tell voters about your experience in Georgia, and frankly, uh, what you took away from that experience uh, that, that, uh, and how that votes for November in, in our home state. So let's start with the fact that you need to make sure you're on the rolls. So most, so there are nine states that by law can purge you for not voting recently. If the last time you voted was in the 2012 election, you may have been moved to inactive status or purged from the rolls. And if you voted last week, it's entirely possible something can happen in the database. So your first le leg of, pro of prevention is make sure you are registered. Check it once a month. And as we get closer to the election, check it every week until you cast your ballot verify that you're registered to vote. Number two, make that plan. I planned to vote by absentee. I applied for my ballot. When it arrived, I took out the very long piece of paper, front and back, filled it out, did my research, picked all my people, 
and then reached for the envelope to return my ballot, and the envelope was sealed shut. Under Georgia law, if I ripped the, ballot, the envelope, I could not use it. So I called, and I had lawyers call. I could not get a replacement envelope. And so I knew that I was going to have to vote on election day. And I had my PPE, I had my preparations, I figured out the best time of day to get there. I stood in line for about 45 minutes. And that was, that was actually great compared to some of my fellow Georgians who were in line for up to eight hours. But I had a plan. But the other reality is if you have impediments, if there are problems, tell someone. One of the ways voter suppression is so insidious, you think it's your fault. You think it's just you. You might complain to your neighbor or to your spouse or to your friends, but they may not have had the same experience. So you think it's just your fault. It's in your head. No, it's not. You deserve better. So if there is a problem, report it. Every single state has a voter hotline. There is the voter hotline that is conducted through the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. And there's the one that Fair Fight has set up in 18 battleground states. So find a number and let someone know as soon as you have a problem. Do not let the impediment of casting your ballot stop you from participating in our democracy. We want to help. So many people want to help, but we can't help you if we don't know there's a problem. Uh, I want to turn to, um, you know, something that's making a little news right now, the uh, conversation around uh, the vice president, because there's never been a woman vice president uh, and there's never been a woman of color nominated for vice president. Uh, and, you know, you and I have talked on here. You've made the case uh, for yourself as to why you think you're qualified for that role. Uh, but I'm wondering if you also want to make the case for why uh, or if you believe that Biden's running mate should be a black woman, no matter which one of you it is. I I have always st stated, first of all, people have accused me of campaigning, of advocating. That's not true. What I do is answer questions. Right. I think that that's the most important thing, especially as a woman of color, especially as a black woman. When you are asked if you are capable of taking on a responsibility, if you demur, if you deny, then people are going to believe you. They're not going to just believe you. They're going to ascribe your belief to others, and it's going to give them an excuse not to ask. So, yes, I am always unequivocal in my response. I also believe diversity in action is a good. It is a wonderful thing to say we want, but it is better when we can see it done. And so, yes, I think that it would be a good idea for us to have a woman of color, to have a black woman as the nominee who is the, the counterpart to Vice President Joe Biden. But fundamentally, there's only one person in this conversation who's ever held that job, and that is the vice president. And he is choosing a partner he is choosing a lieutenant, and it is his responsibility to pick the person that he thinks can help him win and help him govern. And I believe that he will not take any community for granted. I believe he will pick the best partner for him. And I believe that when he does so, I trust him when he says that diversity is how he intends to build his cabinet and to build his leadership. Yes, optimally, it will be a woman of color as his running mate, a black woman. But I do not begrudge any choice that he makes because he has a surfeit of fantastic qualified women to choose from. And I believe that he's going to make the right choice. Yeah. Um, to your point, I mean, all of these women have very impressive resumes, and yet that has not really been the tone and the tenor of this conversation in recent weeks. You know, we had the conversation around electability in the 2020 Democratic primary when we saw historic six women standing for president. And even though this is not an elected position, we're still kind of having some of those conversations around likability and electability. I mean, what do you hear when you hear the word electability? What does that sound like? And why do you think we're back at this conversation now? We've never left it. I mean, let, let's be clear. True. When I ran for governor in Georgia, I was told by women that I was not electable because I was black. Not my gender, my race, but it was the combination of race and gender that they found disqualifying. I'd been a black man, as someone told me. They thought it would be okay, but as a black woman, I just did not seem electable. So this notion that we cross the Rubicon of this argument is a fallacy. And every time we refuse to engage this head on, we continue the dark, insidious nature of this concern. You're electable if you can win, and you can win if you're given a chance to run. And that there are going to be a number of reasons people aren't selected that voters choose not to. But I put a lot of responsibility on the framing that is created by the press. The press tells a story and creates a narrative that gets reinforced by the zeitgeist. 
that's the same narrative about ambition. There, there's a, a framing that I think we have to demand that the press do better about. Uh, it's researched recently, but it was what assailed me in March. And no, I don't deny that I'm ambitious, but the point is that that ambition was derided and de decried, and we're watching it happen again and again. And that's the undercurrent of electability, that you have the temerity to stand for office when you shouldn't be there. That's all electability questions, is do you have the right to, de to ask? Do you have the right to be in this posture? And I think, yes, we have the right. We have, you know, there's a proverb that says, women hold up half the sky. If we're going to do our part of holding up the sky, we deserve to get the title and the opportunity to live and do the work. No, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we've heard from uh, members of the Biden campaign that have denounced this tone and rhetoric, but I'm hearing from a lot of, of women in politics who are saying that they would like to hear from the vice president himself uh, denouncing this tone and rhetoric and really setting, um, you know, uh, that example that, that this kind of uh, discussion uh, about personality traits or, or other criteria aside from qualifications is, is not acceptable uh, in this conversation. It, would you like to hear um, Vice President Biden kind of publicly uh, denounced th this, this tone? I think he's already done it. This is the man who declared early on he was going to select a woman as his running mate. He has been incredibly intentional about engaging women in this process, and he's going to follow through and select a woman. And there is no stronger message of the electability of women than having a woman as your partner in this process. And so I think that he's doing the right thing by focusing on defeating Donald Trump, but more importantly, by doing so with a partner whose gender sends a signal to half the, the country, that he sees us, that he's going to include us. And as with so many other issues, that he doesn't take it for granted. And he's going to not just say what should be done, he's going to do it. Uh, so the Associated Press uh, just recently reported that Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer had met with Vice President Biden in Delaware. Uh, have you recently met with him to discuss potentially governing with him in any capacity? And if so, when was that? And can you share what happened in that meeting? I direct all questions about the vetting process to the Biden campaign. Well, we had to ask. I appreciate it. I want to know. Uh, I mean, I, I know you've also pledged to help Joe Biden get elected, whether you are his running mate or not. Uh, but I want to ask you about some of the down ballot races that you may be interested in, particularly women that you are watching in this cycle. Uh, is there anybody that you are or will be uh, in, endorsing for uh, House or Senate races, governor, mayor? Uh, and can we expect you to see you on the campaign trail or fundraising for any Democrats besides Joe Biden? Absolutely. So in Georgia, because we are a battleground state, we have Senate, we have two Senate races that I know we can win, but there are two women running for House races that I've been proud to endorse and recently held fundraisers for, and that's Carolyn Bordeaux in the Georgia 7th and Congresswoman Lucy McBath in the Georgia 6th. I was I recently did an event for Barbara Bollier, who is running for for the U.S. Senate in Kansas, and I believe I have more coming up in the next few weeks. I'm going to do everything in my power to not simply elect Joe Biden, but to make certain that he has teammates in the House and the Senate and down ballot who can ensure that when we take power on my team, that if Democrats win in January, that if we win in November, that in January, we have the ability to expand access to democracy and to stabilize our democracy across the country. I, I'm most recently been talking about the census because in addition to the election issue, we have a census debacle that's unfolding in front of us. The Census Bureau under a politicized Trump administration, they've decided to artificially truncate the enumerator process. It's called the non-response follow-up time. And that usually is a 75 day period that was supposed to run from May 14th to July 31st. It is now running from August 11th to September 30th, 30 days slashed off and we are already behind in the count. And the problem is that the hardest to count communities, the historically undercounted communities rely heavily on this non-response follow-up period or NARFU in order to be included. If we do not extend that time through congressional action, 
through October 31st, we will have one of the most inaccurate censuses that we have had since the Civil War. And that is not just bad for those historically undercounted communities, it's bad for anyone who lives in the state with those populations, because the resources they need, the resources that help bolster those communities and serve us all from public health crises to criminal justice reform issues, to simply making sure our kids have the food that they need and we have the roads and bridges that work, it all comes from the census. And if the numbers are wrong, then we will not get what we deserve. And so I'm urging everyone to not only pay attention to the election, but ensure that we have an accurate 2020 census. And I created an organization called faircount.org if you wanna help get that done. You beat me to the plug there because I was definitely going to mention Fair Count, which is the other uh, very important work that you are doing in 2020. Uh, going back for a second to Congressman Lewis, uh, because at his funeral, uh, you know, former President Barack Obama called not just for the renewal, but expansions of the Voting Rights Act. And so I wondered what your reaction was to some of those um, suggested expansions. Uh, and, and, and are there any that you would add to the list? I, I agree with them all. In fact, in my book, Our Time is Now, power, purpose, and the fight for a fair America, I laid out exactly that litany. We have seen initial legislative action through HR1, which was the first bill passed under the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, when she took office in January of 2017. We have HR4, which has recently been renamed, as you mentioned, for John Lewis, and that's the Voting Rights Expansion Act. Both are sitting in the Senate and demand action, but those pieces coupled with the right to vote uh, for basically the statehood of DC, self-determination for Puerto Rico and our territories, and I think the conversation about the filibuster are all incredibly necessary. But we have to remember that we must also tackle the funding and structure of how votes are administered in our states. What people seem to not understand, and it's, it's legitimate because we don't talk about it often, is that the right to vote may be in the Constitution. The 19th Amendment may have granted the right to the franchise to women, but the administration of that franchise is delegated to the states and the same states that are willing to strip away access to power on so many other levels are willing to do so by preventing or discouraging women, particularly women of color from participating in the elections that govern our future. And so we have to take action that not only guarantees federal oversight, but ensures and invests in local administration because so voter suppression is hyperpartisan, and that means our solutions have to be hyperpartisan as well. Well, last thing I want to ask you about, uh, if you are not selected as, as Joe Biden's running mate, and that's a decision that we could know any day now, uh, those of us paying attention to political politics are almost surely going to be looking at Georgia's 2022 gubernatorial contest and whether you plan to challenge Governor Brian Kemp in a rematch. Uh, so do you want to make news today for Georgia voters and say whether that is a plan if you are not on the 2020 Democratic presidential ticket? My focus is on making certain that we have fair elections that are free and accessible to every eligible American, that we have an accurate census count, that we have a President Joe Biden, and I'll work on the rest of it after we get those things done. Well, that doesn't sound like a no. Listen, Stacey, thank you so much for being here with us today. We so appreciate all the work that you are doing 100 years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment to ensure that, that women and really all Americans have uh, access to the franchise. Thank you. Erin, it's an, always a pleasure to be with you. So thank you so much for inviting me. Up next, we'll have a word from our presenting sponsors, Intuit and Goldman Sachs, as well as some trivia to see how much you know about the women who fought for a seat at the table in America and beyond. It is a little difficult to navigate as a woman in business. And I think the best way to get through it is just to be aware of the differences and be yourself. For me, how I found how to navigate through that is I just had to be more confident in myself and be more confident in my accolades. It's a very enriching thing to be connected with other women in business. Just hearing other women's stories really just made it more achievable.
venturing into a world that I don't have all the answers to. Obstacles to me are challenges that I'm going to have every day. The Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program helped me to meet those challenges and take them head on. And it's not something I'm afraid of. I have a path to get to my goals and I absolutely feel confident, ready, and that's as a result of this program. And now for something really special. Award-winning actors Meryl Streep and Zoe Saldana performing excerpts from historic speeches by American suffragists. Women like Inez Milholland, Sojourner Truth, Crystal Eastman, and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who fought not just for the right to vote, but for racial justice for women. Hi, I'm Zoe Saldana, and I'm so pleased to be a part of the 19th Represents. Hi, I'm Meryl Streep, and I'm proud to be a part of the 19th Represents, this week of programming celebrating our voting rights centennial and the launch of this nonprofit newsroom by and for women. In this pivotal moment in history, when suffrage for so many truly remains a work in progress, let's take a look back at the voices of women who fought for all women to participate equally in our democracy. Abigail Scott Dunaway, 1834 to 1915. Excerpts from a speech at the Oregon State Women's Suffrage Association, February 11th, 1879, in Portland, Oregon. Every woman who wields a pen or elevates her voice in public whether her mission be that of teacher, preacher, actress, doctor, clerk, artist, architect, editor, or orator, is, maybe unconsciously to herself, but nonetheless surely, occupying her place in the great phalanx of figures that demonstrate mighty problems of what women can do. Some of these may be apathetic, Others may even sneer at the pioneers who are hewing the way to their success. But ignorance or injustice will make no difference in the final result. Every thinker knows, but for this woman movement, not one of these would maintain her place. And but for it, not one of them would have even secured aught. This work will go on till the victory is completed and to the end that liberty and justice may everywhere triumph over every species of tyranny and wrong. Mary Church Terrell, 1863-1954. Speech to the National American Women Suffrage Association, February 18th, 1898, Washington, D.C. When one considers the obstacles encountered by colored women in their effort to educate and cultivate themselves, since they became free, the work they have accomplished and the progress they have made will bear favorable comparison, at least with that of their more fortunate sisters, from whom the opportunity of acquiring knowledge and the means of self-culture have never been entirely withheld. Not only are colored women with ambition and aspiration handicapped on account of their sex, but they are almost everywhere baffled and mocked because of their race. Not only because they are women, but because they are colored women, our discouragement and disappointment meeting them at every turn. But in spite of the obstacles encountered, the progress made by colored women along many lines appears like a veritable miracle of modern times. They are slowly but surely making their way up to the heights wherever they can be scaled. In spite of handicaps and discouragements, they are not losing heart. In a variety of ways, they are rendering valiant service to their race, lifting as they climb, onward and upward they go, struggling and striving and hoping that the buds and the blossoms of their desires may burst into glorious fruition ere long. 
seeking no favors because of their color, nor charity because of their needs. They knock at the door of justice and ask for an equal chance. Inez Milholland, 1886-1916. Excerpts from Appeal to the Women Voters of the West speech, given three months in October, 1916, to audiences in seven Western states. Soon the fight will be over. Victory is in sight. It depends upon how we stand in this coming election. United or divided? Whether we shall win and whether we shall deserve to win. We have no money, no elaborate organization, no one interested in our success, except anxious-hearted women all over the country who cannot come to the battle line themselves. Here and there, in farmhouse and factory, by the fireside, in the hospital and schoolroom, wherever women are sorrowing and working and hoping, they are praying for our success. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, 1825-1911, one of the first African-American women to be published in the United States. Speech at the 11th National Women's Rights Convention, May 1st, 1866, New York City, New York. I do not believe that giving the woman the ballot is immediately going to cure all the ills of life. I do not believe that white women are dewdrops just exhaled from the skies. I think that like men, they may be divided into three classes, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. The good would vote according to their convictions and principles. The bad, as dictated by prejudice or malice. And the indifferent will vote on the strongest side of the question with the winning party. You white women speak here of rights. I speak of wrongs. Let me go tomorrow morning and take my seat in one of your streetcars. I do not know that they will do it in New York, but they will in Philadelphia and the conductor will put up his hand and stop the car rather than let me ride. Gertrude Foster Brown, 1867 to 1956. Excerpts from Recorded Remarks for Pathé, 1915. The most important question before the country today is that of women's suffrage. It is not only votes for women, but the entire question of democracy that is at stake Ever since our government was founded, men have been proclaiming a government that should not be for the benefit of any man or class of men, but that everybody should have equal representation. Gentlemen, that is the real question in votes for women. Do you believe in democracy? Do you want a government of the people, for the people, and by the people? And aren't women people? Millions of women taxpayers are asking for the vote so that they may have representation. Women should have the vote because it would draw husbands and wives, fathers and daughters, brothers and sisters closer together, giving them an equal share and interest in important public questions. Women should have the vote because it is unjust, shameful, and just cowardly for men to deprive women of that which they demand for themselves. Mary McLeod Bethune, 1875-1955, was an American educator, stateswoman, philanthropist, humanitarian, womanist, and civil rights activist. Speech before America's Town Meeting of the Air, November 23, 1939, New York, New York. Perhaps the greatest battle is before us. The fight for a new America, fearless, free, united, morally rearmed, in which 12 million Negroes, shoulder to shoulder with their fair Americans, will strive. That this nation under God will have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, for the people, and by the people, shall not perish from the earth. This dream, this idea, this aspiration, this is what American democracy means to me. Crystal Eastman, 1881 to 1928. This is an excerpt from her Now We Can Begin speech, which was published in The Liberator in 1920 in December. 
What then is the matter with women? What is the problem of women's freedom? It seems to me to be this, how to arrange the world so that women can be human beings with a chance to exercise their infinitely varied gifts in infinitely varied ways, instead of being destined by the accident of their sex to one field of activity, housework and child raising. And second, if and when they choose housework and child raising, to have that occupation recognized by the world as work, requiring a definite economic reward and not merely entitling the performer to be dependent on some man. It is these outward conditions with which an organized feminist movement must concern itself. I now have the great pleasure of introducing a panel of modern-day courageous women, women who can speak to the unequal history of suffrage for women of color and what the implications are for voting rights in the modern day. Nicole Hannah-Jones, the New York Times Magazine domestic correspondent who won a Pulitzer Prize this year for the 1619 Project, will moderate a conversation with Alicia Garza, principal at the Black Futures Lab and co-creator of Black Lives Matter, Maria Teresa Kumar, the founding president of Voto Latino, and Martha S. Jones, an author and professor of history at Johns Hopkins University. Hello everyone, I'm so excited uh, to be able to moderate this panel of such dynamic women, women whose work and voice I admire so much. Um, this is a panel that's going to explore what has largely been treated as an asterisk to the 19th Amendment, but is really the center of the story. And which is that whenever people say that we are now celebrating or commemorating the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote, uh, by amendment in this country, the white in that is treated as silent. So we, we are not going to treat that white as silent today. We know there was only one black person uh, at the suffragist gathering at Seneca Falls, and it wasn't even a woman, it was Frederick Douglass. Um, and that racism has been pervasive throughout the suffragist movement, just as I'd say that today, racism remains an Achilles heel of the women's movement um, and something that we need to deal with and confront. So I would like to welcome you all and we're gonna get right in. I hope that we can have a discussion. Um, I have questions for all of you individually, but if I raise something or if someone else raises something and you want to comment on it, please feel free. We'll act like, you know, this isn't the red table, but we'll act like we're at the kitchen table. So let's start. Uh, I want to start with you, Martha. Um, you've done amazing, really profound work around not just the struggles of uh, Black women to get the franchise, but uh, Black people in general. But I'd like to talk specifically if you could go with us over some of the myths around the origin story of the 19th Amendment, and then tell us the true story about the fight for the 19th Amendment and the internal battles within the suffragist movement. Lots of myths. Um, <laughs> I think that's what we're here to do this year is to bust some of those myths. Um, the first being, of course, that the 19th Amendment um, grants American women the right to vote. Right? Not so fast. Um, American women face lots of impediments at the polls after 1920. Um, age, nationality, residency. Um, but of course, um, most germane for me is the problem of racism. And oftentimes folks say, well, you know, um, the, the, the amendment gave women the vote by law, um, and it was just something else that kept black women, for example, from the polls. But in fact, what we know is that throughout the South and in parts of the West, laws, right? Poll taxes, literacy tests, understanding clauses, grandfather clauses, violence, and intimidation are going to systematically keep African-American women from the polls in too many places. And that this is a premise of the 19th Amendment is that even after a federal amendment, this amendment will not interfere with the capacity of states to deprive black women of the vote. At the same time, I think there's another myth and the myth is that no black women vote. Um, and that's not quite correct either. Um, even before 1920 in states like California, Illinois, New York, Black women are at the polls, are becoming part of party machines, are really using what's at their disposal to build political power even before 
1920. Um, and then, of course, in the fall of that year, after the amendment is ratified, Black women are going to come right away to, on the one hand, we could say test the amendment to really see how far they can go. Um, some of them will succeed in cities like St. Louis and Missouri. Every Black woman in that city practically will register to vote before October is over in 1920. But in Daytona, Florida, the home of Mary McLeod Bethune, um, the Klan will show up again and again and again to intimidate Black women away from the polls. Um, so these are not sound bites, and these are not the material of, um, if you will, a celebration, right? And that's part of why we get caught having to challenge the myths because we're in a year where there are folks who would like to do little more than celebrate, and that requires too often um, muting these stories um, and um, turning down the volume on the fact that racism runs through this movement in every chapter of the story and ultimately leaves Black women to build their own movement for voting rights alongside Black men after 1920, taking us all the way, certainly to this Voting Rights Act in 1965, and I think we could say taking us to this very moment. Could you uh, just expound on that a little bit more for me, Martha? It seems like in some ways, uh, the way we think about the 19th Amendment is the way we tend to think about that simplistic way we tend to think about civil rights in general, which is a law gets passed and then all of a sudden everyone is free, as if these laws have ever been self-enforcing, as if having a law on paper is the same thing as actually being able to exercise your rights. Can you talk about why Black women in particular, um, most Black women still didn't have the franchise after the 19th Amendment, but also about the compromises that the white suffragist movement was willing to make in order to uh, secure their own voting rights, often at the expense of Black women and Black men. So there's no secret um, as we arrive at 1920 in August 26th and that momentous ratification of the amendment. It's no secret that individual states will still be permitted to use their laws to keep Black women from the polls. As I like to put it, Black women become equal to Black men in that they are equally disenfranchised now. Um, so this is not a secret. This is not some skeleton in the closet. This is the premise of the 19th Amendment, which is to say that states are going to do the work um, that the federal government is no longer going to do to ensure that Black women do not upset the balance of power. And this is about the balance of power between political parties, um, especially on the local and the state level where if and when Black women register, as we know in a city like Chicago, they actually have the capacity, right, to tip the scale um, and to get someone like Oscar DePriest, the first Black man elected to Congress since Reconstruction, um, to Congress, right? And that is Black women's organizing, that is Black women getting themselves registered and casting their ballots. So in some ways, the fears of Black women at the polls are justified because Black women are poised, right, to use that power. Um, but I think that um, the question then of where Black Americans are, if you'll allow me a short story, and it is about 1921. Um, in Congress, in the, in the, in the rotunda, um, there's going to be a ceremony in February to unveil a monument to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan Anthony, and Lucretia Mott, the suffrage. Man. And Alice Paul and the National Women's Party is behind this. Well, the National Association of Colored Women, led by Halle Quinn Brown, write to Paul. And, and Brown is insistent that Black women need to be there at this ceremony. And indeed, they are there. They have their moment um, where they unfurl a banner. It's very much a pageant. But behind the scenes, Hallie Quinn Brown and a contingent of Black women call on Alice Paul. And what they ask her is this, don't abandon voting rights. Right? Now we need federal legislation that will override state laws that will keep us from the polls. And please, right, please, politely, but not so politely, insistently, right? We need you to stay in this struggle with us. And what we know is by the end of that season, uh, the National Women's Party will fold. Um, Alice Paul will move on to the Equal Rights Amendment by 1923. 
and black women are left to build a voting rights movement, um, one that is deeply misunderstood because they do so under the, uh, the gloss of a 19th Amendment that appears to have guaranteed to them the right to vote when in fact it's guaranteed them um, nothing. Thank you for that. Um, I want to turn now to you, uh, Alicia. You know, what, what I always find, I say this all the time, is that Black people are so uh, problematic and inconvenient to the uh, American mythology that we want to tell ourselves. So, you know, as uh, white women all across the country are, are celebrating the 19th Amendment, we're like over there like, um, excuse me, can I have a word? Um, so I want to ask you, you know, in, in 1974, the Cumbie River Collective comes together and they issue this statement. And the statement says, if Black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. And that seems like that has always been the fundamental role that Black women have played, having to fight uh, oppression on multiple fronts. So what does it mean to you and how important is intersectionality in the movement for women's rights and human rights and our understanding of the ultimate power of the 19th Amendment? Well, it's incredibly important. And, you know, you'll allow me just a minute to say that, you know, the Kumbahi River Collective Statement is such a foundational pillar in better understanding both the struggle for suffrage from black women, right? But also better understanding this concept, which intersectionality has us hone in on, which is how not to leave anybody behind, how to have a new lens on how we understand how power operates, right? And how to transform power in order to change the conditions of our lives. In that very statement, you know, the Kumbahi River Collective also says uh, that, you know, essentially to understand the issue of how race and sex and class intersect, that, that white women fundamentally have to understand that, um, you know, that black women will struggle with black men over the issue of sexism, but we will also join with black men, right, around the issues of racism. And that, you know, we don't, we don't get to separate ourselves in, into components, right, because we are all one entity and that we're having to battle these dynamics all at the same time. Uh, my aside here will say that I do believe that the work that you've done, Nicole, is another foundational pillar, just like the Kambahi River Collective Statement, that better helps us understand how we got here and what it means for uh, the formation of this nation and what it means for the formation of the systems that organize our lives. With that being said, I think that when we look at the conditions of Black women in the economy, in our democracy, in our society, what we find is that Black women so often, because of race and gender right, and class, all at the same time, and then you can also add into here uh, questions of citizenship and nationality, uh, questions of sexuality, right? That, that, that the conditions of our lives uh, are certainly shaped by systems that were designed to exclude us for the purposes of maintaining a certain power relationship, right, that um, essentially concentrates power into the hands of white men and at times white women at the expense of everyone else who does not fit into those categories. We see this explicitly in the case of domestic workers. You know, domestic work is rooted in the legacy of slavery. And in fact, domestic work, uh, as it, it was initially designed, was Black women's work. It was the work that was done to care for families, to do the reproductive labor that was necessary for the rest of the economy. And as a result, that entire sector is shaped in such a way where the conditions uh, of our employment, right, reflect the conditions of our lives in, in other aspects. For example, domestic workers and agricultural workers um, have long been excluded from many of the protections that other workers enjoy, largely because domestic workers and agricultural workers were Black, Latino, Filipino, Chinese workers. Um, and today, you actually see that same legacy of slavery, that 
you know, domestic work as a sector, as an industry, the care sector as an industry is largely unregulated. And it's because of who does that work. It's because uh, when, when women are doing that work, when women of color are doing that work, when immigrant women and immigrant women of color are doing that work, um, it is seen as work that is just part of the family. It's part of what we're just supposed to be doing as opposed to work that should be valued, that should be respected, and that should be afforded the same level of dignity that we would afford perhaps to white workers. You'll also see that domestic workers are often excluded from the ability to join unions for the same purpose. Because as we were trying to kind of shape the conditions of this economy, um, what was happening was that there were compromises being made, right, amongst white workers, um, white men and Southern lawmakers, right, who joined together to say, we want to exclude black women and immigrant women from the kinds of protections that we're fighting for, for ourselves. They found common cause in exclusion. And I think as we are moving into 2020, into one of the, uh, I would say the most pivotal election cycle in my generation, we have an opportunity to say that we are going to coalesce around making sure that there are rights for everyone and that nobody gets behind gets left behind, not domestic workers, not other essential and care workers, not black women, not immigrant women, right? We want to make sure that this is a moment that we break open what was broken open in the 1930s. If they were coming together around exclusion for the purposes of maintaining a level of power uh, imbalance and, uh, and concentrating power, isn't it possible that women could come together in this moment to ensure an expansion of our rights and an, an, a, 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 a way of being collaborative that has as of yet not been seen before and in a way of coming together that actually doesn't leave anybody behind and doesn't leave anybody out. Thank you for that. I want to uh, move to you, Maria. So when we look at the, the history of, of what happens after the 19th Amendment, uh, the Latina experience is a bit more mixed. We know that um, Latinas as well as uh, indigenous people who didn't speak English, for instance, were denied ballots in certain cities and states after the passage of the 19th Amendment. Yet at the same time, uh, the first Latina was elected to statewide office in 1922. Of course, it would take, I think, another almost 70 years before we'd see a first uh, Latina win a seat in, con in the US Congress. But so you have seen kind of this more uh, mixed uh, result from the 19th Amendment. When we think about the historic significance of the 19th Amendment, where do uh, Latinos, uh, another group who have historically been erased from this narrative, where do they fit into the story? Yeah, no, first of all, thanks for having this conversation. I think as we're part of it, we are in the process of celebrating so many gains in this country, we have to recognize that it wasn't for all of us. And level setting that allows us to not only understand our history, to ground us, but to actually recognize where we need to make fundamental changes. And quite frankly, in the Latino experience, for most of our, all of our history is a big erasure in the United States, uh, sadly, right? We, there's, you know, often said Latinos, many of us did not move the border, the border moved across us. Mm -hmm. But that has never actually meant very little when it comes to our political impact and our force. And it was really through the struggle of the civil rights movement where the majority of Latinos received the voting, the access to the ballot. It was because of the struggle with the African-American community that we were able to reap some of the benefits of your pain in the labor, quite frankly. But Latinos as a whole community did not receive full enfranchisement, so to speak, until 1974. When they went away with when they went away with uh, language testing before you had to have be English dominant and it disenfranchised not just Latinos but many Native Americans and Asian Americans and the list goes on. But it wasn't until 1974 that we actually got full enfranchisement and even then it was a struggle. Part of the challenge too is that we know that 24 percent of the Latino community identifies as Afro Latino. And because we have such a swath of who passes and who doesn't, it is really hard to, for us to nail down our history because, again, it's very rarely documented. Less than 3% of our newsrooms recognize or actually have Latinos in those newsrooms, even though we are close to 20% of the population. And that's today. 
When we're talking about what are the, you know, what were the deals that were brokered behind uh, closed doors to ensure that people had systemic power, who was left out? And Alicia, you highlight domestic workers and farm workers. That's happening today. 20% of Latino labor was excluded out of the CARES Act that was passed in Congress in May. 20%. 1.7 million Asians. And that was either because they were U.S. citizens with undocumented loved ones, or they found themselves undocumented themselves, even though 27%, uh, $27 billion are paid into the coffers of undocumented. And I say this because when we start talking about this issue of, of race and, and access, to the, uh, access to the polls and enfranchisement, there is hundreds of millions of dollars spent every single year to ensure that our communities are not participating, they are not voting. It's through either suppression of the ballot box, it's through the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, it's either through suppression and misinformation. And they do it very intentionally because they recognize that it's the ballot box that allows us power. It allows us to change these systemic institutions that do not reflect 40% of the American people. 135 million of us are of people of color. 135 million strong. And so when you just enfranchise intentionally 40% of the population, we cannot address the issues that COVID had, has brought wide open. I would argue that in the, what, about 100 years ago, what women were fighting for and women of color and black women were fighting for was to level up an even playing field. And it's taken 100 years under a pandemic that's lasted less than 30 day, uh, 90 days for us to expose the institutional racism that we talk about, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's who is an essential worker. 41% of the essential workers are women, women of color. And it has taken a pandemic for us to open the eyes of the American public and recognize that the battle of 100 years is very present at a doorstep, but we cannot be strong and continue to lead if we don't have the enfranchisement of the least among us. Latinas make 53 cents on the dollar. That is abysmal when we recognize that we are doing a lot of the essential work of child caring, of taking care of our elderly, of picking the food. It's only under an administration that is so, so backwards and so corrupt that they are trying to negotiate lowering the wages of farm workers during a pandemic in a moment that that is who we rely on right now to sustain ourselves. And so this moment allows us to, for us to reflect of who do we want to be as a people, to reckon with our history, but recognize it's the intersectionality in our, our struggles as women of color that will allow us to carry forth. Because if we are completely honest and transparent, the people that go out and vote for progressive policies, for progressive movements, it is women of color disproportionately led by African-American women, but Latinas, I can guarantee you, are right there behind you. And it is because we are speaking voice to a reality that we never recuperated from the beginning of the, the, the moment this country was founded. But we have to speak to that reality. We have to speak to our history. The challenge with the work that I do at Voto Latino is that I can't get people agitated because oftentimes they don't know the great harm that has happened under the structures that we have been raised by. But once they start understanding or recognizing it, they act and react and fight and run for office and vote. The latest example is when the tragic death of George Floyd. At Voto Latino, we knew that policing and Black Lives Matter is an allyship within the African-American community and the Latino community. We immediately switched all of our digital program to connect voting and protest. And we were able to register over 97,000 people in less than 17 days because people found in the Latino community that that was an issue for them. And they wanted to make sure that George Floyd, uh, absolutely not the, la not the first one, but that he may be the last one. When you ask Latinos what they care about, they want health care, fair pay. But their third issue that's mob mobilizing them today to go to the voting booth in November is racial injustice among Blacks and Latinos. That's powerful but it's only accessible to us 
if we have the access to the vote. And our concern at Volta Latino, my concern, is that there's so many shenanigans right now to trying to prevent us, one, to have these type of conversations of our, you know, our joint destiny, our joint effort, our joint possibility. But also, my, the challenge is that people are afraid to cast a ballot or feel that their vote doesn't matter. And so we have to talk about the truth of how hard it was for us to achieve this moment, but also the possibility when you have communities uniting. Uh, Martha, I want to turn uh, from the past to the present. Um, as Maria said, Black women, actually of all groups, um, are the most likely to vote for the common good. They're most likely to vote for uh, social safety net programs, uh, opposed to death penalty. Um, Black women really vote for our community uh, over our individual wants and needs. Uh, Black women have, um, depending on the election, the highest rates of voting of all groups. And yet there's this persistent myth somehow that black women don't vote. Uh, we, you know, we saw after the last presidential election, this, this immediate drive to put the blame on black voters that black people should have come out and, and Hillary would have won. Can you talk about the uh, reality of black women voting and rates of voting and why this myth about black women and voting is so pernicious? I mean, the myth has a long history, doesn't it? And it has a, it has a, it, it grows out of um, when we ask the question about women in the vote, um, women in politics, um, the country turns to white women and white women's organization, white women's spaces, and then say, well, we don't see any black women. We don't see Latinas here. Perhaps they're not interested in politics. They're not engaged. They're not coming to the table. So I think the myth grows out of that tunnel vision that the asterisk and our talk today is intended to draw attention to, right? Which is that you can't only look in white spaces because when you do what you're going to find are white women. Yes. Uh, but more importantly, what's happening today, the statistics you've recited, um, and from my view, again, that is a manifestation of the work that Black women have been doing across generations. Query a Black women political leader today about how she came to be here. I'll choose Val Demings because she's on Joe Biden's <laughs> short list. Val Demings will tell you that she came to politics because as a girl in Florida, she learned about Mary McLeod Bethune. Bethune, born in Reconstruction, lives till 1955, an educator, a voting rights activist, leads Roosevelt's Black Cabinet, helps found the United Nations. That is the history, right, that we carry with us. We know our history. Um, and the question in this moment is, I think, how to sort of make that visible, make that manifest. That is for our own good, but that is for, as you all have said, for a kind of common good. Because when we drill in to those Black women, whether they are getting out the vote or turning out at the polls or running for office, when we drill in what we discover is a community of women that is not looking for political power for its own sake. Mm -hmm. And it's not looking for political power to serve some parochial interest, right? And this is one of the things in writing Vanguard that I didn't expect is how far back it goes that black women speak of humanity. Mm -hmm. That is the frame, that is the claim, that is the ambition. And in too many moments in American history, that seems like, that seems crazy. <laughs> that seems insane, that seems, you know, so far from anything pragmatic um, that it might be discounted. But don't we know, right, that we live in a moment, 2021, pandemic, right, defining so much of our present and our future that we understand that what it means to be bound up with humanity um, is the politics. It's the only way forward. Um, and in my work, I think that's why those numbers matter, right, because Black women are not simply bringing themselves to politics. They are bringing a set of values and a set of ambitions that they have been carrying and offering up to this country for a very long time. And people better than me, better equipped than me will tell us whether um, there's the possibility, right, that that might actually 
catch on um, and help move us through you know, a challenge of unprecedented complexity, but it's there, it's always been there, right? And it's there for us today, um, if indeed we're looking for a way forward um, that does precisely the things that Alicia and Maria have um, pointed to. So I want to talk to you about, you know, the Latino vote is much more split than the Black vote. And uh, for a second, it seemed like Republicans were going to lean into that and actually try to bring uh, Latino elect into their electorate. And instead, they clearly done a very sharp right turn and decided that they were going to embrace uh, more xenophobia and lean into voter suppression um, as a tactic instead. So mm -hmm. I would love for you to talk to me about what voter suppression looks like specifically for Latino communities and with women accounting for half of all uh, voter Latino registrants, how are Latinas fighting the suppression and working to make their voices and their vo votes heard? So the, the best unknown story of Shelby County versus Eric Holder was that Shelby County had experienced more than a 70% increase in the Latino population in the 2010 census. And it wasn't that individuals in the Latino community were eligible to vote that moment in those elections, but that they were going to age in to 2020. So every single, there were 22 jurisdictions that basically went ahead and gutted all of their restrictions after Shelby County was announced. And every single of those 2020, every single of those 2020 jurisdictions had experienced a 40% or more increase in the Latino population. They were preparing for 2016 because in 2016, one million young Latino youths were aging into the voting population. So since 2016 to 2020, we have 4 million more young voters in the Latino community. And they're the ones that brought us in to be officially the second largest eligible voting population in this country. And when folks say, well, that sounds nefarious, I like to point to their most recent challenge of the Supreme Court when they tried to include a citizenship question in the census. And the reason the census, the citizenship question was thrown out was because they found GOP receipts. It was a GOP operative email that described that by including a citizenship question, they were intent on creating, and I'm paraphrasing, but almost to the, to the letter of the word, white, non-Hispanic, Republican districts. So the Republican Party was not even interested in courting any Republican of any shade. They were very clear that their intent was to create white, non-Hispanic, Republican districts. And it is that piece of you know, knowledge, along with what happened with Shelby County, that we recognize that the disenfranchisement in the Latino community is very real and they will stop at nothing to increase intimidation. During the 2016 election, part of the Russian interference, the foreign interference that was discovered, was that Latino community was being served Spanish language ads with a big fat picture of Hillary Clinton saying, text your vote in so you don't have to stand in line. Targeting a community who does not, for, uh, for the most part, is a first generation community that does not know the ropes. At Voto Latino, we had to stop ICE raids that were scheduled on the same time as voting day in El Paso, just blocks away from voting booths. We have to part we've partnered with Florida uh, local universities to ensure that people have access to the voting booth because they have intentionally removed voting booths outside of polling places, excuse me, on university campuses, making people drive across town. And so these are some of the shenanigans, but they are representative of how they disenfranchise the African-American community as well. In Georgia, you had over 200 voting booths go missing in the African-American communities and then in the new populations of Latino communities. This is all by design because for the very first time, you have populations of not just the Latino community, but the African-American community and the Asian community that have potentially more ability to sway an election. For the first time, you're gonna have 12 million more young voters that are eligible to vote and cast a ballot who are larger than baby boomers, two thirds of them who are young people of, power, of color. That's powerful. And if so, if you are 
back in your, you know, in your uh, operative mode back in 2010, reading these demographic shifts, recognizing when a population, not just Latinos, but young uh, black people and young Asian Americans are aging into a population, you're going to do everything to stop that enfranchisement. And it is going to take it to the Supreme Court and it's going to use every single tool in your arsenal because instead of adapting and being wise and trying to actually fight for the vote, the easiest thing is to suppress the vote because then you do not have to change. Uh, Alicia, I want to go to you. The 19th Amendment was passed during a global pandemic. Hmm. And here we are 100 years later. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your work with the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the importance of cross-racial movements and how particularly, particularly during this pandemic, uh, how these heavily Black and Latino workers who are the ones out on the front lines who cannot simply work from home, how they can be organized into a powerful voting block for change? Absolutely. So, you know, most of my organizing career has been focused on bringing together multiracial movements in order to build the kind of multiracial democracy that we not only deserve, but that we need in order to, frankly, save humanity. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, right now, in the midst of a, a, a range of crises, a crisis in our democracy, a deepening economic crisis, a public health crisis, and of course, a sharpening uh, climate crisis, uh, multiracial movements and multiracial organizing is more critical than ever. I think we've seen the impact of that also through the rebellions that have swept the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, seven years ago, it was, um, you know, a little bit tricky for some folks to say Black Lives Matter. <laughs> and it was a lot of Black people saying Black Lives Matter. But seven years later, what we're seeing is that even Black Lives Matter has erupted into a multiracial movement. And as a result, I think what we're also noticing from the connections that have been made over the last seven years, that actually the kinds of demands that we can advance in this moment have expanded. When it comes to the work of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, what we're really trying to pay attention to here is how do the women who care for the people that we care for the most actually be able to not only have better working conditions, better wages, all of the things that all workers deserve, but how do we also put these women in a position to be able to reshape the industry that has been stamped by the legacy of slavery? Can we put at the center of this industry uh, the, the Black women, the, the uh, women from the Asian diaspora, the, the women from um, Latino communities? Can we bring these women together to create a new kind of care industry that is really investing in the bonds between us and investing in the people who make those bonds strong? And part of what we've been fighting for in the midst of this pandemic is not just uh, trying to make these uh, relief and recovery bills better, although that is incredibly important because so many people are getting left behind, including for reasons of you know, not being able to pay child support or not having been able to pay your taxes. But essential workers, which are, as you all have said, largely women of color and immigrant women, have up until now been completely left out of the equation of what it means to um, access relief and access recovery, even though we know that this country cannot function without essential workers. We've also been fighting to expand the definition of essential workers because certainly while our, you know, our medical professionals are incredibly important in this moment, we cannot forget about the people who are caring for our elderly loved ones in nursing homes that are being um, rocked, right, by COVID, but also being rocked by a lack of investment from uh, city and state governments in our care infrastructure. We're working very, very hard to make sure that not only are we strengthening the floor for essential workers in this economy, um, but that we also create uh, more expansiveness in terms of the ceiling. I also want to say, though, that in this moment, what becomes so important in the project of building multiracial movements that can help us achieve a multiracial democracy is more deeply understanding the conditions that our communities are facing. 
so much of how uh, white supremacy and white nationalism is not only able to survive, but able to, you know, reinvigorate and reinvent itself is because part of what white supremacy does is it sells stories about us back to us that encourage us to be divided. Frankly, I, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard over, you know, the last two decades that we internalize on our own and we don't actually realize where those stories come from. Uh, Maria Teresa, you, you laid it out very clearly that essentially, you know, when it comes to what it means to bring us together, it means that not only do we have to find what's similar about us, but we also have to look into what is different about us and why. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just going to tell a quick story that, you know, I organized in, in Southeast San Francisco for a decade in an organization that was bringing together Black and Latino workers to reshape the economy uh, in the city and county of San Francisco. And so often our approaches to multiracial movement building can often be, well, we're all the same, right? And that's why we should be together. But unfortunately, under pressure, that, that uh, surface level sameness breaks down very quickly. Uh, you know, in private conversations, people will say things like, you know, well, yeah, like I'm down with the Latino community, but, you know, why are there so many Latinos living in one house? right? <laughs> and what people usually do is go, oh my God, you can't say that, don't say that, don't say that, don't say that. But the problem with that approach is you're telling people not to um, uh, investigate, right? Mm -hmm. The economic conditions that put people in a, in a position, right? Where you've got to crowd a bunch of people into a home because you cannot afford to find housing in a place like the Bay Area for every single family, especially not on the wages that are afforded to our communities. On the opposite end, right? We would hear stories from people outside of our, you know, unity building projects where folks would say, yeah, 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 I'm down with black folks, but why do I see so many black people on the corner not working? You all had a civil rights movement mm -hmm. and you're not taking advantage of the opportunities that you fought for for yourselves. These are the kinds of stories that are actually um, um, designed by white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. To keep us divided and to keep us blaming ourselves for conditions that we did not create. One of the essential strengths in building multiracial movements for the purpose of building a multiracial democracy is to investigate the differences between our communities, not to put ourselves in weird little boxes, you know, for the purposes of representation, but for the purposes of better understanding how white supremacy has been successful in creating the types of conditions that are unique to each of our communities to, that keep us apart. How white supremacy has been able to use the issue of citizenship and nationhood uh, to keep immigrant communities out. Um, how white supremacy has been so successful in using the language of effort, ability, and agency, right, to keep people from supporting Black people's uh, struggle for liberation, and how the narratives of white supremacy actually have us um, yearning to become white, as opposed to yearning to transform the balance of power and the dynamics of power themselves, so that um, you know, we're not just trying to create a world, right, where white people are on the bottom and people of color are on the top, but that we're changing the relationships between each other so that power in and of itself is not corrosive, but that power allows us to be powerful together uh, and to distribute resources in such a way where everybody has and nobody is left out. So mm -hmm. to me, in this moment of a global pandemic, I will just close by saying this, you know, I think what's clear to us now, four months into this thing, <laughs> is that there's not a normal that we are going to go back to. And frankly, things were not great before the pandemic. Um, I second that. <laughs> <laughs> frankly, um, what we're able to do in this moment that we maybe weren't as well positioned to do four months ago is use the opportunity of crisis to actually usher in a new way of being with each other. We could bring forward some things from the past, and by the past, I mean four months ago, <laughs> and, and try to recreate those in a different context. But I think we're all clear that the kind of change that we need right now is the kind of change that 
rejects, right, the ways in which our lives were organized and tries to put into place a new way of organizing ourselves and each other that ejects corruption from our political system, that ejects and drives back underground and frankly into oblivion, um, white nationalism and white supremacy, and that creates the space for what a multiracial democracy can provide us, which is the ability to participate in the decisions that impact our lives, which is the ability to create and design the stories that we tell about each other, not only who we are now, but who we can be, and are about the ability to distribute resources in such a way uh, where nobody gets left behind. And so that is actually the purpose of building multiracial movements, and it is the possibility of what a multiracial democracy can offer us. Thank you. Uh, that was such a profound answer and why I'm so glad to be moderating this panel. So I've been, we're almost out of time and I have like so many more questions, but I'm going to try to get in two more. So uh, I'm not going to um, give this question to anyone in particular, but will one person answer and will one person try to answer succinctly just so I can get to uh, these last two questions. Um, 100 years after the 19th Amendment, we have yet to see a woman president or a woman vice president. We know that uh, Joe Biden has promised that he will choose a woman as a vice president. So I would like one of you to speak to the importance of that, but then to go a step further, because we also know that black women in particular are the base of the Democratic Party. And even though uh, presidential candidates seek out black women's support every election cycle, they then almost always abandon black women's agendas as soon as they are elected. Given the history around racism within women's rights movements and the way black women have been long sidelined, what would it mean if the first woman vice president is also a black woman? Now, who can answer that real quick? Because he just gave <laughs> me the one you, minute. I'll jump in and just say, I okay. think the point has it already been made right, because it's not a single black woman who's under mm -hmm. consideration. It is this extraordinarily um, wide ranging uh, group of black women, um, which to me says, right, we're, we're here. We actually are here. And I don't know who Biden's vice, president candidate, vice presidential candidate will be, um, but what I know is that I think for black women, there's no retreating from this moment. Um, and that that to me is really the significance of what's happening right now. Ask me next week and maybe I'll have a different answer. <laughs> but, I, I, but I do think it also having, and to your point, Martha, that it's, it's the individual of the black woman and it is not this monolith. And it's recognizing that each one stands on their own for their expertise and their beauty and their intelligence through something, through a different lens. And I think for oftentimes for communities of color, that's the hardest stereotype to break through, that we are all the same. And instead, they are each of them, far, I mean, far so different. And, but I do think that by picking a black woman at, as part of his ticket, it's not talking about where we are, but it is a bridge to the future of where we're going. Mm -hmm. And it will make an, a statement to the present chaos that we're facing right now. It'll speak to my children in a way that barriers have been broken. And it says a resounding message to the international stage that America is back and we're moving forward together. And to me, that's what gives me hope and it also gives me courage and it also inspires me because what we are living right now is the future has been born. My children represent, who are eight and six, represent the majority minority country. And we need to get to work because our institutions are not reflective of where we are today, of the future that's been born. So that seems like such a, Great way to end the conversation, even though I did have one more question. Um, but it is time. Um, this was just such a great chat. I hope all of our viewers will get as much from it as I did. There's nothing in the world like having a chance to sit 
virtually in a room with brilliant <laughs> women of color and, and talk about how we're going to save humanity as we've always done. So thank each of you for taking the time to join me in this panel. And, you know, let's understand that the work of the 19th Amendment is not done. And particularly if you are a white woman watching this panel, uh, I'm going to evoke this sign that I saw at the Women's March um, right after Trump was elected. And uh, there were these white women sitting together and they had a sign that said, if Hillary had won, we'd be at brunch right now. That's the problem. Life was not good for your uh, mm -hmm. sisters of color. And it wouldn't have probably been good for your sisters of color if Hillary had won. The work of the 19th Amendment is to continue to uh, expand democracy for all women. And uh, if white women really want to vindicate the 19th Amendment, you should be pushing for reinstatement of the Voting Rights Act as hard as you are pushing for other rights that you're fighting for. So thank you all. And please, let's all continue to go out and do the work. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, thank you everyone. That was an incredible conversation to round out an incredible day. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. If you liked what you saw today, we'd love it if you'd join us as founding members of the 19th. We're a member-supported newsroom, and we can't put on great free programming like this without your support. Every $19 helps. Join us at 19thnews.org. If you missed any part of yesterday or today's programming, or you want to rewatch, visit 19thnews.org forward slash events. Up next, a short introduction to our sponsor, Lingua Franca. Lingua Franca is committed to using their brand and platform to inspire change. That's why you can now find 19th branded shirts and sweaters available for purchase on their website. A portion of the proceeds of each purchase will come directly to the 19th and will help to support our nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom. Shop the 19th line at linguafranca.nyc. We hope you'll join us tomorrow for day three, where we'll consider what's at stake in the fight for gender equity in the U.S. and abroad, and hear how some conservative women hope to change the face of their party. The lineup includes Melinda Gates, a performance by Madam Gandhi, and Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, leading a panel conversation with congressional candidates Young Kim of California, Beth Van Dyne of Texas, and Valerie Ramirez Mukherjee of Illinois. A special thanks again to our generous sponsors and philanthropic partners. Goldman Sachs. Intuit, The Impact Seat, The Lenfest Institute, The Philadelphia Inquirer, The Wincote Foundation, The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, The Barbara Lee Family Foundation, The Stardust Fund, PEN America, The Heinz Endowments, CVS Health, The Panacea Collective, Aero PR, and Lingua Franca. We can't wait to see you all back here tomorrow.